You know what these three players are like? They're like that utensil that you bought years ago and you stuffed into the back of a drawer in your kitchen and then you kind of pull it out and you're like, what the hell is this? It's like, I, I, I bought it, I have it, but it doesn't really do anything for me anymore. Do I keep it? Do I become a hoarder? Do I just let it sit there? Do I put it back? Do I throw it away? What do I do? What is this? Three blind mice, please step up to the plate. You're on bust watch. <laughs> Welcome back to the Fantasy Hockey Podcast. Time to talk about three players that truly embody the three blind mice. They've done absolutely nothing. We've gotten countless amounts of questions for them, and it only made sense to bundle up all the underperforming defensemen that we've gotten questions about in the three of P.K. Subban, uh, John Klingberg, and Eric Gustafson. It, it makes sense for them all to be on one big, big bust watch. So they're all being placed on bust watch. We're going to talk about each one of them. Now, they're all a little bit different in the sense of, do you drop them? What do they need to actually be relevant? Who's in front of them? Um, what's happening with the team? It, they're all very different, uh, but in very many ways, they are actually quite similar. But the advice for each one is actually quite different at the end of the day. So before we get into it, just a quick reminder, subscribe if you haven't already for future Hot Hands, Bust Watch, and all kinds of fantasy hockey videos, and also turn on notifications so you get them before anybody else. Okay, so let's start first with P.K. Subban. I think many people, including ourselves, had him build as one of the best defensemen in the draft this year in terms of value. Like we thought, OK, you'd get him pretty late. He has a lot of upside uh, and it made sense, right? He went to the Devils, who seemed to have completely fixed things in, in many areas. They picked up Simmons. Uh, they got Jack Hughes. Taylor Hall is healthy. Uh, everything kind of seemed to be going in the right direction. And also on top of that, he seemed like a lock for top power play. And when he was in Nashville and he was on the top power play, he did really, really well. And so everyone thought, OK, well, well, this is good. So most likely you got P.K. Subban as a third defenseman or perhaps you waited until later on and said, OK, well, I can get a second defenseman caliber player later on in the draft and fade those third and fourth defensemen until later and maybe be peripheral specialists. If you did that, it hasn't quite worked out has it so let's let's explore what's going on with pk suban and see if he can regain his form so let's start as we always do with players and look at their deployment on daily faceoff and so pk suban is playing on the top pairing with damon severson fine pairing he gets quite a few uh, five on five minutes but you'd want better on that top pairing but the problem is when you look at all the pairings for new jersey they just don't have good defense in general their defense is kind of garbage and that's why they went after PK Subban because they didn't really have good defensemen and then he's on the second power play unit with Jesper Bratt, Nico Hishir, Pavel Zacha and Damon Severson as well there so he's on that second unit which is not fantastic and he's playing about 45 percent of the team's power play as a whole now if we take a look at uh, the research tool in season tool here this custom date range is going to be his last seven days uh, and this is going to be his full season, obviously, here, the 1920 season. And, and we're also going to be talking about his last seven days. So if we take a look at just the season compared to last year, he was injured for a long time with the Preds. And he only played 63 games last year. But he was on a 40-point pace last year. He's currently on a 34-point pace for the season. In his last seven days, the last three games played, he's on a 27-point pace because he only got one point in three games. Now, there's a few things that are very concerning about P.K. Subban. Uh, and a few things that are going to make me a lot lower on him than I would have been. So the first thing is his ice time is up slightly. It's up 5%. Cool. That's good. The problem is his point pace is down. His shot pace is down around 6%. Not a ton, but it's enough to matter. His shooting percentage is actually up from last year. That's concerning thing number one. His shooting percentage is at 7% compared to last year's 5%. So it's already 25% higher than last year, pretty much. And then if you take a look at his on-ice shooting percentage, it's only down 2%. That's it. His shooting at eight, his on-ice shooting percentage is 8.5%. Last year, it was 8.8%. So there's not really much of a difference there. His IPP is also not very different from last year, which was at 38% this year. And then last year, it was at 42%. So it's not that different. That's not good. That Those are two concerning things there. So that's three concerning things in a row right there. His on-ice shooting percentage is not much different. His IPP is not much different. And then let's take a look at the power play. So his actual average time on ice on the power play has gone up a little bit. So New Jersey is getting slightly more opportunities than Nashville did. And 
his team power play percentage. So how, how much time of his team's power play does he play? Last year on the Preds, he played 48% on that second unit. This year, he's playing 45% of the Devils power play time. That's not good because you would have liked to see that higher. Now, it's also concerning to me that it's still it's still 45%. I thought it'd be lower than that given how much better that top unit is. So immediately, he's put at a disadvantage from a power play perspective, and also you think, well, okay, what is he going to get up to, 60%? Is that really going to make that much of a difference? Sure, that top power play produces much better, but at the end of the day, he's not doing much with that 45% of power play time. So with P.K. Subban, looking at this, you're like, okay, well, we're kind of seeing who he is. He is the P.K. Subban of last year with less points and less shots. That, that's who he is. He's getting slightly more hits, 96 compared to 73 last year. Less blocks, though, 75 compared to 98. So when you look at P.K. Subban at the moment, all I can really tell you is you're looking at P.K. Subban of the Nashville Predators. That's it. That's who he is right now. The, the New Jersey Devils traded for P.K. Subban of last year, which is actually good for them. That's fine for them. His advanced stats look good. Why is that good for the Devils? Because they don't have good defensemen. It doesn't matter if he's last year as P.K. Subban. That's still better than anything that they have. And so that's good from a real-life perspective, from a fantasy perspective. That's really bad. That is that is real bad. And so to me, even if he's on the top power play, let's say, you're looking at a P.K. Subban who at the moment, I got to say his points pace is like, what, 45 at best? 10 more points on pace than he's at right now? Probably. That's probably what you're looking at with P.K. Subban as a 45-point defenseman at best. And so, to me, P.K. Subban is someone who I'd immediately be trying to trade to see if somebody would like to buy him and would maybe pay a good price. And on top of that, he may be droppable in shallow leagues. It sucks to say, but it's the truth. When your on-ice shooting percentage is the same as last year, your IPP is the same as last year, your shooting percentage is actually better than last year, your your average time on ice is higher than last year, and yet your point pace is still down, there's not much room for you to go up unless you just start to go off. And so to me, P.K. Subban is someone that, yes, is there potential there for him to do better? Sure. But the question is, does it really matter much? And I don't think it does. I don't think it really does. I'm... Very low on P.K. Subban rest of season. I think Brandon is a little higher than me. He thinks that if he gets top power play, he could become a 55-point defenseman. I don't see it. Looking at the numbers now, I don't see it. What's going to happen? His shooting percentage needs to get pretty inflated. It already somewhat is compared to last year. His on-ice shooting percentage needs to get inflated, but it's kind of the same as last year, and that's fine. I'd rather just assume it's going to stay the same. He's been an, a low IPP guy for a while now, so I don't really see how he's going to get to like a 50% IPP. Um, so all that being said, I don't see it for PK Subban. I, I, he's not a big play driver for the New Jersey Devils. When you see what the role he plays, it's very different than like a Roman Yossi in Nashville. Uh, he is more of a, just in the play, involved in the play, but not one of the major play drivers. Whereas you have Hughes, Palmieri, Heeshear, those guys can all really drive the play. And so they're the ones who end up getting the higher a IPP because they're the ones involved in the play more often. And so with PK Subban, like I said, a little bit long there, but trade or drop. It's pretty much it. I, I would not really be holding out for much. If you're in a deep league, let's say a 12, a 12 person league that um, rosters, let's say five or six defensemen, then he's probably actually still worth it to an extent. Um, I'd still look to trade and see if anyone would bite. If you're in a 14 person league, most likely worth it. Uh, but anything shallower than that, and he's just, he's just not worth it anymore. Okay, and now moving on to John Klingberg. Maybe one of the biggest disappointments of the year. Uh, he has not looked good. It's been extremely disappointing. Now, one thing that is concerning to me is he's played 16 games. That's a lot of games. That means we have a pretty good sample size on who John Klingberg is. And I will preface this with that. It's not pretty. It is really, really not pretty for John Klingberg. But as always, let's jump into first his deployment and take a look at where he's playing. He's currently playing on the top pairing with Essel and Dell. That's a really good top pairing. I actually really, really like that. Uh, on the first power play unit, he is with Essel and Dell as well. They're doing the two defensemen on the top power play thing. Not good. Uh, Jamie, Ben, Tyler Sagan, and Alexander, Alexander Radulov are also on that top power play. Uh, so he's still on the top power play unit. I know they've sometimes tried Miro Heiskanen up there, uh, but it just it hasn't stuck anytime they've tried that. And so I don't think it will. 
Um, I could see Essel and Dell getting swapped out with Hints or Pavelski or something like that. But for now, this is this is a fine top power play unit. Now, when you take a look at his stats, here's where you start to get both worried and also a little bit of what the hell is going on and can he even get there, right? Um, so 16 games in, he's at a 15 point pace. 15. Yes, it's that bad right now. That's how bad it is. He's not too far off from his expected goals. He has one goal. He has 1.81 expected goals for. Uh, so maybe give him one more. Um, and if you put here, let's say, let's give him the two. He actually gets pretty close to his shooting percentage from last year. His shooting percentage last year was 6.5%. He's currently at five. Uh, no, he's currently at 2.8. Sorry. 2.8% on the season so far for shooting compared to 6.5 last year. But if you give him two goals up to that expected goals for, he goes up to 5.6, which isn't far off from last year's 6.5. So... He's pretty much off of, let's say, one goal right now. That's what he's missing. Now, his on-ice shooting percentage is ridiculously low at 4.4%. Um, last year's was 8.8%, so he's down around 50% in on-ice shooting percentage at the moment, which honestly is kind of a, a, the whole stars are suffering from the same thing. They're all pretty much having an, a low on-ice shooting percentage. Similar to kind of like Timo Meyer, for example, low on a shooting percentage. And then you couple that also that his IPP is pretty low. It's at 33%, whereas last year it was at 53%. So he's been involved in maybe two less points, so to say, somewhere around there, two to three less points. Um, and that's th that's good for 37% lower than last year. He's actually only gotten secondary assists all season. He hasn't factored into a single primary assist. That's not fantastic. I would like to see Klingberg involved in more primary assists. Last year, 65% of his assists were secondary, but I'd still like to see at this point in the season so far, some primary assists, and that hasn't quite happened. His time on the power play is down a little bit. It's down around 18%, uh, 56, 57% this year on the power play, 70% last year. So it's not down by a ton. It is down by a little bit. The actual time he plays on the power play is not down very much, only 8%. Um, so though that all looks kind of good. And, and the problem right now that I see with John Klingberg is that, yeah, his numbers are down. Um, like his shooting percentage should be higher. His IPP and on ice shooting percentage should be higher, but you're still not looking at a points pace of last year. What you'd need from Klingberg is you need like 11 points at this, at this moment for it to all make sense. For him to be on a similar pace from last year, from a points perspective, you'd need 11 to 12 points, and he currently has three. So that's a lot of points that he's missing out on, but again, if you get him up to that 11, the only real ways I see it are higher shooting percentage, but like we said, that's only a difference of one goal to get him back to a sustainable shooting percentage, and then his on-ice shooting percentage at IPP needs to get higher, and that's probably only like, I don't know, four-ish points, something like that. So you're looking at like five points that really make sense from a sustainable perspective. So then you have to point the finger to Dallas isn't playing that well, isn't playing well enough for Klingberg. So Klingberg to me is a tough case because he's neither a buy low. I wouldn't be buying Klingberg personally um, because you'd be buying most likely assuming, okay, he's going to get back to his 60 point base and I'm going to get a 60 point defenseman. Let's go. I don't see that. I'd buy Klingberg at like a 50-point defenseman um, simply because you're taking on risk that Dallas isn't good and he just won't get in on as many points as he did last year. Um, so that's that, that's the risk you're taking on, right? It's just that Dallas isn't as good, so there just aren't as many points to be had. Similar to uh, Timo Meyer, where if you're buying him, you've got to assume, okay, be ready for less point totals simply because there just isn't as much there for him to get in on. And on top of that, his shooting is a little bit down, but not by much. And so I'd hold on Klingberg, um, maybe drop in very shallow leagues, like we're talking eight person, um, or if you only roster like three defensemen in a league, something like that, then Klingberg might be droppable at this point. But nonetheless, I mean, the pedigree is there, right? He's one of those players that you look at and you're like, well, the pedigree is there, but you're also looking at a guy with a 15 point pace and not much to really go off of. Um, yeah, Klingberg is frustrating and he's difficult to give advice for, but I, I've got to say, I think for the most part, I'd say in 75% of leagues right now, I'd say hold and don't really give that long of a leash. I'd say pretty short leash. I would for sure be shopping him in every single league. I'm not so sure I'd buy, to be honest. I, I don't think I'd buy, especially when you see guys like Lindell, uh, Miro Heiskanen around him. I would say his job is safe, but it's not as safe as you think he got somewhat like pk suban right where you'd say yeah he's a top power play defenseman until he's not 
And until Miro Heiskanen takes it over or Essa Lindell gets a chance and they just try to find something that works. Um, so to me, look, John Klingberg, I'd reevaluate and think he's more of a 50 point defenseman with a 55 point ceiling and potentially a floor of 45 points and not many peripherals. His shots are down a little bit. His hits are up like by 10 hits. His block pace is actually down. And so he's just a guy who for points leagues, If a 45 to 50 point defenseman is worth it to you with a 55 point ceiling, then he is worth holding. If that's not worth it to you, then I try to shop and see if someone would pay that 55 to 60 point defenseman pace. Oh boy, the most frustrating of them all. Yep, the most disappointing one of them all, maybe. I saw some people who kept him this year over other defensemen. Big yikes. Um, Yeah, Gustafson is not exactly a good player this season um and you could make the argument that last year he was insanely lucky which i would make that argument for is that last year he just got insanely lucky when it came to uh how well he did and he benefited a lot from just career years in jonathan tay's career years or not career year but you know fantastic year from patrick kane huge season from dylan strom from alex to brincat he benefited from a lot of things and now he's been scratched game That's not good. When a player gets scratched, that should send a lot of signals to you in fantasy. A lot. Especially when it's a defenseman. Because you normally don't scratch your top power play, top pairing defenseman. And now, he's not top pairing, top power play anymore. He is now third pairing, top power play. So, I should take that back. He is top power play. Sweet. But... He is third pairing. He got 14 minutes last game. 14. That's it. That's awful for a defenseman. Just atrocious. I mean, that's... I I can't even comprehend just how bad that is. And now Adam Boquist is up. He got a goal. And he's got to be snipping at the heels of Eric Gustafson. I would not be shocked. And if a game or two, we see um, Adam Boquist, who's on the second power play unit right now, take over that first power play unit. Um, so Eric Gustafson seems to be kind of out of favor at the moment in um, in Chicago. He reminds me a lot of Gostas Bear, and that's not good. <laughs> he reminds me of Gostas Bear a lot, that third pairing top power play person who doesn't have a good lock on the top power play and just isn't really doing much. And when you take a look at last season, this season compared to last season for Eric Gustafson, a lot of things are down. His ice time is down a lot. His last two games, he's only played 16 minutes of average time on ice. His ice time in general is down around 14%. He's on a 27-point pace, which is shockingly better than Klingberg. R.I.P. Klingberg. Uh, He got 62 points last year, but it came off of an insanely high and inflated shooting percentage for himself. Um, His shot pace right now is down to 103 versus 166 last year. He's currently shooting at 6.7%, which is actually really, really good for a defenseman. So I'd say that's a sustainable, fine, fine thing for him. It's not fantastic, but he also doesn't shoot very much. So it doesn't matter if it's a little bit high. Um... It just means he's not going to get very many goals. And last year, his expected goals for was eight, and he got 17. And last year, he had a shooting percentage, like I said, of 10.7 with a lot of shots as well. So the fact that both of those are down, not great for him. Already, you're seeing a huge decrease in points just from goals because he's not shooting as much, and his shooting percentage has come down to a reasonable amount. Now, if we take a look at last year's on-ice shooting percentage, it was 10.7%. It's actually higher this year at 112 Yet, his IPP has gone down to 25%, which was 52% last year. That actually makes sense. A third-pairing defenseman should not really have that high of an IPP. You're not going to be involved in that many points as a third-pairing defenseman. Uh, And that, so to me, Eric Gustafson is this guy who is a third-pairing defenseman, not on the ice for that many shots on goal, has a low IPP, and even if he gets back to that 50% IPP, who cares? Because again, he's not on the ice for that many shots. That on-ice shooting percentage can't really get better. So where are these points going to come from for him? He's still playing 70% of the team's power play percentage, but has no power. Has two power play points, two, two power play assists. I should rephrase that right there. Uh, four power play shots on goal. I just don't see where these points are going to come from for Eric Gustafson currently. His hit pace is down. His block pace is down. Honestly, he's probably like a 40-point defenseman. Probably something like that. I I don't even need that many stats to talk about Eric Gustafson. He's disappointing. I wouldn't hold. He's droppable. He's droppable in almost every single league. There is most likely better. 
If Latang is out, I'd rather have Justin Schultz over Eric Gustafson. There's a lot of people I'd rather have over Eric Gustafson. You're in a bangers league. A peripheral spot is probably better than Eric Gustafson. Quite frankly, in many leagues, I would argue that probably an empty roster spot on defense for an extra forward streamer is worth more than Eric Gustafson. It's just, he's not, that. there's nowhere really right now that I'm looking at and saying, yeah, this guy's worth it. He's, he's like Gostas Bear. If Gostas Bear isn't worth it to you, he's not, then neither is, Go- then neither is Gustafson. And so to me, Gustafson is a droppable guy who, I don't even know if you can shop at this point. I would just cut ties. It's not worth it. I don't know where, unless he gets top pairing again and that top power play clicks and Tay starts going off, where are the points going to come from? They're not. He's not on the ice for enough shots on goal to get up to that 62-point pace. Last year was an anomaly, 100%. He played 79 games. It was his first good season. I think we saw the best of Eric Gustafson, and those days are behind him. So there you go. Hope you enjoyed the first ever multiple player bust watch. Um, And also let me know who you want to see on the next bust watch. I know we've heard of, for example, Phil Kessel. Um, So let us know what you're thinking. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.